sure. um, it's very different. There's a lot of stuff that was in the script that just didn't work in the film when we were editing it, or it was like, I think the first cut was like three hours long. So, wow. so cutting it down to what it is now, which is like an hour 40, took a lot of like killing your darlings. Yeah. Is there anything on the cutting room floor that you're like, fuck, I wish that, I wish that made it? Yeah. My favorite shot look. in the film was on the cutting room floor. And it was like, I loved it. It was so pretty. And I was like, so pretty. And Costas had like such a great moment, but we just couldn't get it to work like going into that scene. This movie for me really highlights the importance of show don't tell. There is so much happening, Mm. especially in Costas' eyes, that tells us so much more than any dialogue does. So I'm curious to know what that looks like in a screenplay perspective. What does show don't tell look like when you are writing the Aegean? Yeah, it's really tough in a screenplay screenplay perspective because, you know, you hand a screenplay to someone and usually they've got page limits, you know, 90 pages is going to be like 90 right. minutes and you hand the Aegean to someone and there's how are you going to hit 90 minutes with a screenplay <laughs> that is largely, you know, for Costas in particular, like, all in the eyes and all in his performance. Um, so he sort of ran into that challenge up the front. I had a lot of people telling me like, oh, it's not going to make time. And then first cut was like three hours, three hours, 20 or whatever. So, <laughs> in. And then it was all about just cutting it back. But I think when you're making the movie, it's more about, it's a real, it's like three people in particular who come together to make that performance work, right? And it's mm. obviously me having written the script and directing Costas, but Costas had to bring so much in his performance all the time about what he's thinking about and it's a big challenge for him as well like not mm. every actor would be keen to jump on board a project where they're in it the whole time but they don't speak until one you know right at the end yeah um and then also the editor so we had a great editor and steph here in brisbane and um you know that's all about making sure like each moment is held for the right amount of time so the audience is getting what they need to get without it feeling too performative or like ham-fisted Interesting. What what were the conversations like when you were sort of going through the script with Costas about what he he needed to show? How quick did he sort of click onto that that emotion of of his character, but also the idea that he was not going to say a lot of lines in the film really in, until the end? What were those conversations like when you were fleshing out the character together? Yeah, he. I mean, he clicked on really quick. Um, each of the actors are sort of worked with in a different way, you know, like Costas yeah. in particular was the sort of person who just loves to dive into like the backstory of the character and loves to dive into less so like particularly for his role where it's not like we're going to be running lines too much except for the final ending. Um, it's more for him getting an understanding about like why the character's feeling the way he's feeling. So he got a lot more backstory to Hector than the script had uh, and it was really just he and I sort of working out the backstory for the character together that I think gave him a lot of that stuff. And then also he was in, um, we shot on the island of Kithra in Greece and he came to the island before he had to start filming. Uh, and he went out fishing with a few of the local fishermen. And so I think he got a lot of experience over there as well. He's obviously uh, he's obviously Australian Greek as well. So he has a bit of, um, a bit of experience there too. In, that's interesting. I because I was going to ask sort of what you knew about Costas' experiences with either with, with fishing and boating beforehand. But I, I, I'm curious to know how or what that profession does to a character like his. Was there was that always going to be where Costas' character sort of had his roots in this boating and fishing world, or is that something that more lent into this authentic Greek feeling of the story? No, I always thought it would be at like a fishing movie. Nice. Um, Part of that was because I saw another film at the time. I'm not sure if you went to see that with me as well, like if we mm. saw that at the same screening, but it was um, it's called Fisherman Friends 2. Oh, yes. You yeah. <laughs> I remember yeah, Fisherman like, Friends 2. Yeah. It could not be further away from this film if you try it, <laughs> but that was like one of the reasons why I was like, oh, I could make it. There's one moment in there where he's like on the boat with his the ghost of his father. The ghost of his father. I yeah, I remember that. that <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing that and thinking like, you know, I could I could make a whole movie just based on this scenario, yeah, and yeah. that's sort of where the basis came from. Um, Interesting, but yeah, so he's always a fisherman. Uh, and then for a while, I toyed around before I started writing a script, like with the idea. I really wanted to base it around my own interactions with my grandfather, who sort of the whole yeah. film Hector is sort of a proxy for my grandfather in many respects, and how he was dealing with the loss of my grandmother. 
Right. Um, and yeah, so the whole film was sort of when I was thinking about it, was it going to be, I felt Greece was the first place I wanted to film it. And then I thought maybe it would work in like off the shores of Ireland as well. Okay. Uh, but at the time, Banshees of Inishroon had just come out and, and a bunch of other Irish content was coming out. And I was just like, you know what, let's go Greece. Greece, I feel, yeah. is perfect for this film. Picturesque too. Like, and the way you shoot Greece as well is it's incredibly beautiful to look at. I'm curious to know mm. then if if Hector is somewhat of a proxy of, of your of your grandfather, which it sounds like a very intimate personal story. Where does Theo come into the picture? How did the the uh, character of Theo sort of uh, evolve throughout the screenwriting process? And then and when you cast Nikki, how does he evolve even further from there? Yeah, well, I mean. Probably Theo is probably a representation of myself in some respects, mainly from his interaction with Hector and trying to draw him out of his personal grief. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole point of setting it on the island and of having Hector going through this, you know, how he deals with the complexities of his own grief mm. uh, is then backed up against Theo, uh, who's like a young refugee teenager who comes to the island mm. Um and sort of draws Hector out of his shell. Uh, so Theo, I suppose, the drawing him out of his shell part is definitely based on my own re relationship with my grandfather. Yeah, right. um, and, you know, my grandfather and I, we used to see movies all the time together. It used to be one of the things we did. And yeah. after my grandmother died, he didn't want to go see films anymore. Uh, uh, and I couldn't yeah. get him back to the cinema um, until Top Gun Maverick. Top Gun Maverick, he was like, yeah, I left him a message. He left me a message back and he was like, yeah, we'll go see that one, Jack. I will go see that. <laughs> And now we do like every fortnight we do like a film screening together here oh, in the apartment. Awesome. So yeah. that's really nice. But that's I lovely, think that yeah. also once we set the movie on the island and we set it in Greece, mm. it then Theo's character started to take on a bit more complexity and diverge away from myself. So then, he, you know, we started to build it on some of the situations that were happening in Greece at the time and continue to happen. Um, sure. So Theo became a refugee. The island of Kithara has, is, a great, incredible island, beautiful, mm. but there are a number of shipwrecks around it as well. So we started to build that into his character. And then when Nikki came on board, I think when Nikki came on board, the character took on like a really buoyant personality because Nikki is mm. just like the most happy, yeah, kind person you've ever met. So that that buoyant personality really like his opening scene when he first sort of meets Hector, uh, that that buoyant mm -hmm. personality really comes through. Like I, I think that's one of those main things that that. Is such a stark contrast, which is which is interesting. Then between a, the stark contrast between the characters is interesting because I guess as a director you kind of have to create intentional antagonistic chemistry chemistry between the two. Theo's a guy who's trying to connect with Hector. Hector's a guy who's just like, I don't I don't want to be around you, but you're still you keep coming back and you keep coming back. I'm curious to know with the three of you working together, what does that look like creating antagonistic chemistry rather than trying to get characters to to bond ultimately. Yeah. I mean, Costas, it's different for all of us. And I feel like Costas in particular, hmm. he just turns it on. You know, yeah, camera right. turns on, on. Oh, camera's off. Costas is just like hanging out with you. The night guy. guy yeah. <laughs> um, Nikki, he goes into his process a bit more. So if he's okay. got a day when he's got a big monologue or he's got a day when he is, um, he's got to be antagonistic or something like that. He he's just sort of like in his own zone. He's listening to music. He's hanging around um, sort of by himself on the set. And then if it's a day when he's got a bit more camaraderie, he's mm. his usual bubbly personality. But then, you know, later in the evening or on the weekends, yeah, we were hanging out with Nikki all the time. Nikki and I would play basketball every weekend together, actually. So that Absolutely. was fun, fun time. That's awesome. Um, I want to ask about, because you were obviously talking about the the personal connection you kind of have with this story and how it evolved out, out of there, or at least the intentional uh, connection with the proxies of the characters. I heard a director say once, uh, a writer-director, she said... She created a story where specificity leads to universality. Like if, if you have a story that feels so specific, it will universally touch people. I'm curious to know if that's something you consider when you create a story like the Aegean. Is there something that you kind of go, as you delve more and more into the specificity of things, you kind of get an idea that it will touch people more universally? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I feel like the the film was very like the, all the themes of the film were designed to be universal, right? Like it's, it's set in Greece. It's produced in Australia. It, part of it was shot in Australia, part in Greece. The character the actors come from all around the world. The crew comes from all around the world. So I think what all of them resonated with 
And what I resonated with was a lot of the universal universality of some of the themes. So the grief and the loss, we've all experienced that in some way, shape or form. Sure. Um, and then also sort of the, you know, the idea of hope, the whole idea of the film too, was to make something that by the end was buoyant, by the end felt hopeful, mm. uh, that you left the cinema feeling upbeat. And so yeah. I think that part of that comes from making sure that while, you know, the the themes that are perhaps prevalent throughout the start of the film with grief and loss are universal, uh, the theme of hope is also universal too. Can you can you not have hope without the heartbreak? Do you think like I, cause I, I there's this film is is so inherently dramatic and as you're watching it you are feeling I think you really feel Hector's grief and loss on the screen like it, it's almost I wouldn't say tough tough to sit through but it, it hurts at points it, it's really painful to sort of see what he's going through uh, and watching Theo try and crack into that can you not have hope without the heartbreak? Do you think maybe in just a cinematic sense? Yeah. Definitely, I think. I think that's right. I think that, like, it's the heartbreak in this is so. Is you mentioned earlier, like, it's very much show don't tell, and I think that's key to how I wanted to represent the heartbreak in this. You know, like a lot of the inspirations from a filmic perspective with things like Patterson, uh, Wim Wenders films, Jim Jarmusch films, uh, things that immerse you in that person's life. Um, so for Hector, it's it's not just the repetitiveness of his days but it's also the like the idea of being on this big island and being so alone in amongst mm. this incredible landscape yeah. and so for the audience we try and also give them that experience a little bit right like we try and put them into this space there's a lot of like big wides and panoramics of the island yeah. without hector in them or without any characters in them so that you too are experiencing that a little bit um and yeah, I mean, it does come down to that whole show don't tell perspective, and that's really something we wanted in the film, right? It's, even by the end, not everything is necessarily wrapped up in a neat little bow. Sure, um, but there's enough that's gone down that you can sort of leave with that sense of hope. This part of the story has been told, and it kind of goes, "What what is next mm. for for Hector and for Theo?" Um, yeah, you're talking a little bit earlier about how the importance of of the editing and then Costas and the writing directing is, is integral to sort of how his, his story is being told. I think in it, another integral part is Alistair Harrison's score, which right from the get go, it, it kind of hits you in the face. Like this is a score that that makes itself so apparent. And then it sticks about onto the end. And that hopeful feeling at the end is, is exacerbated even more by, by his final, uh, final musical score. I'm curious to know, obviously I, I'm aware that you, you were, you were friends with him and you knew him as well, but um, how did you work with him? How did you work with Alistair to sort of make the score a character of the film itself as well? Mm. Uh, yeah. As you said, like Al and I have been friends for since 2006. So it's been years and years and uh, he's the best musician I know. And there was no one else I was going to pick really for it. Uh, if he was keen to do it yeah. and he was very keen to do it. We met, a lot before I went to shoot it. Um, so we were already working on it back then. Uh, and he he came up with just so much music. It was a lot of like trial and error. It was a lot of sort of soundboards that he would put together and then I would put together to try and get an understanding of what we wanted the film to feel like. And I suppose that's also before the editing and before the script, like it gives you a good idea doing that soundboard of what, even before you go and film it, what you want the feeling of the film to be. Right. Which I think, you know, can be very different depending on how you cut it and how you grade it and all of that. Sure. Whereas with this music, you could really get the feeling before you went over there. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's been great. I mean, the good thing about knowing Alistair for so many years is that if there's any issues, I can just call him and be like, nah, you have to change this. <laughs> you know, there's no like, there's no hiding the honesty, right? Like sure. if I didn't like something, I would just be like, I don't like this. And if I love something, I loved it. But the only issue really with Alistair was that he composed so much music for the film. We wound up cutting like probably a third of his score in the end. Oh, wow. He was just keeps kept coming up with incredible ideas. Jeez. The inspiration strikes. Is that, we'll have to see the, like the uh, deleted scenes. We'll have to see the, the deleted music score as well come out in a, in a physical form yeah, at some put point. On Spotify. Put on Spotify. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just pump it through like, pumping through speakers around the country, I'd say. <laughs> well, uh, it's going to be pumping through uh, cinema speakers, I guess, as a transition to sort of closing out. This is obviously premiering at Brisbane International Film Festival, but I think 
which is which is an incredible place to do it being a Brisbane filmmaker but I think as well the Greek film festival which is playing might have even more resonance and, and even more emotional pull for the audiences, audiences there how excited are you to see uh, how excited are you to for a Greek audience to see this film on the big screen something that, that even though it is a universal story might have some specific uh, specificity for them as well yeah, not as excited as I am for that segue there. I mean, yeah, that was great. Yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. That's why they call him the best in the game, folks. That's why they call him the best. I in think the you're game. the only person who segues said that. like that, right? <laughs> you don't get that in other interviews. Uh, <laughs> I'm not like regular uh, junkets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's playing at Brisbane, which is going to be great because yeah. uh, that was always a dream of mine to play at Brisbane International Film Festival. Mm. Um, but yeah, also the Greek Film Festival. I mean. Yeah. What first when Ada and I started Film Focus all those years ago, like one of the first things we went to was one of the, you know, the I think we went to the Scandinavian Film Festival at Palace yeah. Cinemas. And so for me, I love those sort of location specific or country specific or region specific festivals mm. that they run around the country. And um, yeah, it's been going great. Uh, you know, it's great to see the Greek community in Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane have all been keen to go see it. Um, and hopefully they all like the film. I think they will. I think they will. Uh, as a cheeky question, what's next? What's next for Jacob Richardson? What's next for Film Focus? What are we following up the Aegean with? Uh, yeah, we're in development on a murder mystery at the moment. So that's nice. good. Not to be like set in France, really cool concept and idea. Uh, but we're also in post production already on a documentary about the eclipse. So it's called A Moment in the Sun. And oh, uh, Ada and I are producing that. And that is currently in post production over in Brooklyn in new york nice hopefully this year or early next year that's the that's the plan probably next year probably next year for that one uh but yeah so i think it's all about like just keeping the momentum going right like mm. make this one you know make another one um and yeah just see where it leads <laughs>